word, I'm a politician, and taking back that that is not a bad thing. Now, there are certain bad players that have tainted what we do, which what we do is public service, or we're staff members that are trying to better our states, our regions, our families, our neighborhoods. That's what we're trying to do. And so I've been touting this idea for years. And finally, it's come to fruition. So I appreciate that you've come here to work with this very esteemed group of panelists that you might just take one nugget. And I ask that after we're done here today, go up and talk to them, get a card, share your card, that type of thing. And I know that sounds kind of hippie of me, but this is how good things start, is usually in a small room with a few select people that have a passion. Before we get started, there's a few housekeeping things that we need to go through. Um, I want to say thank you to NCSL, to the foundation, and for you all coming here today to support this, this group. This is being live streamed, so you all need to know right now that you will be out there. I hope you haven't committed a felony. Um, if you have, we've got you on record being here. I've gone over the session's purpose and panel, and, and, and I'm going to let the panel introduce themselves because I believe in order for us to have a discussion, they can explain their life. I can just say, well, there's a bunch of guys. Uh, they can explain it a lot better than I can, and, and probably with a lot more brevity. The idea is, and I'm going to date myself, I'm going to do a Phil Donahue thing. They each have mics. There's one mic there, but I'm going to put on my flats and wander around. And if you have questions, raise your hand, and I will come over to you. And we can address those questions after they've each done their participation in all of this. So at this point, we're going to let the panel go one-on-one -on -one and introduce themselves. Gentlemen, thank you for coming. Is this thing on? Good. Uh, my name is Gene Rose. Uh, I am a former journalist. Uh, to date myself, uh, I worked for a newspaper that was in the smallest town that had competing daily newspapers. So you can imagine how long ago that was since not many towns uh, even have one newspaper now, right? Um, I worked for 15 years as a communications director for the Missouri House of Representatives. For about 15 years, I was a communications director for the National Conference of State Legislatures. And now I have my own shingle. Uh, good morning. My name is Corey Cook. I'm the Dean of the School of Public Service at Boise State University in Boise, Idaho. Uh, my background is as a political scientist. I study state and local politics primarily. A lot of my work is trying to get young people involved in public service, uh, developing the skills and knowledge they need to be effective public service leaders. Good morning. My name is Troy Carter. I serve in the State Senate in Louisiana, representing New Orleans, Jefferson, and Plaquemine parishes. Um, I've had Roughly 30 years experience in academia, business, and local and state government, first being elected to the New Orleans City Council, then the House of Representatives, and now the State Senate. Good morning. My name is Steve Rothstein. I'm the Executive Director of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. Um, I've spent my career both in government and starting and running nonprofits, and hope if you have any time between the many, many valuable sessions, or if you can stay an extra day, you can visit the Kennedy Library, which is about uh, two miles down the road. Good morning, my name is Carl Kurtz, and I am a legislative junkie. I've uh, been uh, watching, studying, uh, helping with legislatures in the United States and around the world uh, for nearly 50 years, uh, uh, more than 45, less than 50. And uh, it's a delight for me uh, to be here. I'm retired uh, from 42 years on the NCSL staff and continue to do consulting with my own consulting firm, Legis Matters, where my sole client is NCSL. <laughs> Representative Ponson, do you want me to go ahead? Please. So my task is to sort of set the stage of presenting ideas about what the public thinks of legislators that then uh, these folks can solve all those problems. Um, when you talk to legislators or political scientists for that matter about the public image of elected officials, 
you hear three very common observations. In fact, they are so common that within the small world of legislative speak, it's almost a, uh, they're almost cliches. The first one is that the public just doesn't know much about state legislators or state legislatures. Um, I'll illustrate that in a couple of different ways. In, in 2003, NCSL did a national poll uh, in which 72% uh, uh, of the respondents to the poll were able to identi correctly identify the party of the governor of their state. That's pretty good. Nearly three quarters uh, got that question right. Uh, about 60% of them, three in five, were able to identify correctly which party was in control of the Congress. More than half of them could actually identify the name of the most recent American Idol winner. Um, the politicians, we weren't asking names, we were just asking political parties, but uh, more than half, that, that astonished me as someone who doesn't really follow uh, uh, popular culture very much. Uh, but when it came to the party that controlled their state legislature, less than one third of them could correctly identify that party. Uh, so they don't know much. Um, and every legislator I've ever met has a story about being in the grocery store on a street corner and running into a constituent who says, how are things going in Washington? Or why aren't you guys doing something about that Middle East problem? Uh, so I think all of you uh, recognize that kind of problem. So the second uh, cliche, second common observation is that people like their own legislator, but the, not the legislature or legislators in general. This poll is about Congress, uh, showing the difference between uh, those who uh, think that their uh, own US uh, House members should be reelected compared to their views of uh, most members of the Congress. And you can see that uh, there's a probably between a 15 and a 25 point gap uh, between those two. They, again, they think highly of their own legislator, but not legislators in general. Now this poll is about the Congress, but the same idea applies to state legislatures. And if we uh, had as good a time series, the, the question I would have put up there was not, uh, do you think uh, most members of Congress should be reelected, but rather, do you approve of the performance of your legislature? And if I had those numbers available to me, which I do for a few individual years, uh, the differences would be even greater. So the third kind of uh, common observation um, has to do with a question about honesty and trustworthiness of 22 different professions. Uh, that the Gallup poll has regularly asked over time. And it used to be that elected officials ranked next to last among those 22 prof uh, professions uh, behind only car salespeople. But in the most recent Gallup poll, the car salespeople are up a tick and the legislators are down and, uh, I'm sorry, the elected officials generally are down and they now uh, rank the lowest. But so beyond those uh, common observations, let's try to dig just a little bit uh, deeper. And here, this is a uh, poll from the Pew Research Center showing uh, three different groups of uh, people, elected officials, the, the public's opinion of three different groups of people, elected officials, business leaders, and the typical American on three positive traits and two negative traits. So uh, on intelligence, you can see that elected officials uh, rate just right 
there exactly with the typical American, you know, that's kind of nice. We like our legislators to be, to represent America, right? Uh, but in fact, we know from other research that state legislators and elected officials in general are much better educated than the general public, and they are much more knowledgeable, and uh, uh, obviously the public doesn't uh, know this. On patriotism, uh, uh, it's the only one where business leaders uh, scored less well than the general public uh, and elected officials. And on honesty, it's again the same story of uh, the public's disregard for the honesty of uh, elected officials. On the negative traits, uh, uh, on selfishness, uh, elected officials come out number one in this group and on laziness, uh, hard to believe given how hard I know most state legislators work to uh, both in their uh, political world and in their whatever their personal uh, and business world is, but 48% uh, uh, of the public views elected officials as being lazy. So going on to another one, uh, this one is kind of disturbing to me. There, there is, uh, th th this measures the uh, uh, percentage of people who say that uh, elected officials don't care what people like me think compared to they care what people like me think. And you can see the, the growing uh, 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 divide between these two uh, over the last uh, uh, 15 years. In uh, uh, in that same 2003 uh, poll that I referred to earlier by NCSL, we gave uh, people 15 different words that they could respond to. What, do you, what images do you, occur to you when you hear the term politics? And uh, uh, they could answer as many as they wanted to. And uh, here you can see that two-thirds of them associate the word politics with power. And not all bad. I mean, it's, it can be just descriptive. Uh, but over half of them, uh, associate politics with corrupt and lying. And only about one in 20 people chose positive words like responsive or trustworthy. Wow. This is nothing new. Aristophanes in 424 BC said, you, all, you have all the characteristics of a popular politician, a horrible voice, bad breeding, and a vulgar manner. And in 410 BC, he said, under every stone lurks a politician. <laughs> the late and beloved uh, uh, Alan Rosenthal, a political scientist uh, who was uh, my mentor in many ways, was very fond of quoting uh, these data from his native state of New Jersey. Uh, in a poll there in the 1990s, one third of New Jerseyans said that they believe that between 50 and 100% of state legislators take bribes. Now this was at a time uh, when there were no scandals uh, in the newspapers, nobody indicted uh, in New Jersey. Uh, then in 2007, uh, the uh, average estimate of the percentage of legislators who would sell out to lobbyists in exchange for free meals, trips, or campaign contributions was 60%. Now, um, I'm not picking on New Jersey. This would be probably fairly typical uh, in most states. So um, the picture I'm presenting here is one of cynicism, and uh, I, I I think that what we're going to try to do in the rest of this discussion is talk a little bit about what causes the cynicism, what consequences it has, and uh, what, if anything, we can do about it. So uh, with that, I'll, am I turning it over to you, Representative Consen? We'll just go right down the panel, and for each of you to kind of throw out your ideas, <clears throat> excuse me, and then we'll go questions from there. I think that's where we're going to get most interactive 
is the questions from the crowd. So we'll start with you, sir. Okay, again, Steve Rothstein from the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. Um, even after those slides, I, I, I do want to say that I am an incurable optimist. Um, and what are the ways that we, to look at that? Uh, first is, is one of the data points, in addition to these great slides, which were very helpful, Pew does an annual survey of trust in government. In 1962, when John Kennedy was in office, 75% of the people said they trusted government, three quarters. A year ago, before the recent election, it was 19%. So obviously a dramatic change. And I made copies of the slide. It's on the table with some other material. You can look at it as relating to, to national trends. But one of the reasons for, for that we, I think learned from President Kennedy is transparency. So when he came into office, there had never been live televised press conferences. And he started uh, that uh, many of his staff recommended against it. What if it was, what if he said something wrong? What if it moved the markets? And he felt that the value of transparency was more important in terms of confidence. Um, so he did his first one five days after inaugurated and on, on average every 16 days. So in the first, so while he was president for roughly 1,000 days, he did 64 press conferences. Um, they were on must-see TV that on average 18 million people watched them. Um, and they were at the State Department, so three to 400 press attended them, and they you know, covered a wide range of topics. So not that you're gonna do nationalized press conferences, but the value of transparency. In fact, the day after the Bay of Pigs, clearly a dark day in the Kennedy administration, he did a press conference and got up and said, I'm the commander in chief and I'm the one responsible. So he didn't just do them when there was good things to announce, um, he also used humor a lot. He used humor a lot, self-deprecating humor. There's, there's many stories, but one in particular where uh, uh, one of the reporters was saying, he was asking about a particular uh, commentator who was using a Boston accent and kind of making fun of the president and said, Mr. President, what do you think about this? And he says, well, I don't think he did a very good accent. I think my brother Teddy's more upset because he sounds like him. Um, so using humor, but the idea of using humor and transparency, I think those are two lessons for all of you as legislators, as staff, and figuring out how to use today's media in those elements of transparency and humor. So with that, I'll, I'll move on to others. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I think those are very good points. Um, transparency, humor, accessibility uh, are all things that I think go a long ways into changing the image of, of elected officials or of public servants, period. I think we're as much responsible for um, the stigma that's attached to public service as we are victims. And, I, and I'll tell you why. We've allowed people to change the paradigm and to redefine public service, and we're afraid to say that we're politicians. We're afraid to say that we're career politicians. In any other aspect of professional life, when you zero in and perfect your craft, you study it, you know the art, you know the science, you have the interpersonal skills and you can articulate a vision and gather people together to accomplish it, you're heralded as an accomplished, successful professional. If you amass those skills as an elected official, somehow we've allowed the career politician or politician to be a bad word and so people have run from it. And you have people who are running for office who says, I'm not a politician, I'm a housewife. I'm not a politician, I'm a school teacher. I'm not a politician, I'm a business owner. Well, we can be all those things. And in fact, our democracy is set up that we are all those things, that we are a snapshot of our given states and our country, and from every village to small city to big metropolis, we are the voice of the people. And if you were wheeled into a hospital clutching your chest, you would want the most experienced heart surgeon to operate on you. You wouldn't say, give me that orderly over there. I'll try him, because I don't want that career doctor. I don't want that professional physician who has performed surgery on hundreds of hearts successfully. And somehow we've allowed the talking heads, we've allowed the, the spin wizards, to somehow make our craft dirty. 
to somehow allow them to determine that while there have in fact been a few bad actors out there who have had larceny in their heart, who've done bad things, who've given shame to our craft, it's the smallest percentage compared to all of the hard working men and women I know in government, be it elected, appointed, or otherwise, who give their time, their talent, and in most cases, serve at a deficit. Because when we're at conferences like this, and we're in the legislative session, we're at town hall meetings, we're at bar mitzvahs, and we're at graduations, and we're at community meetings, we're not at our businesses. If I could segue quickly into that, because it's a great point, and I think we're gonna have to get to that point the media's role, I mean, that's huge. And so once we get through everybody's opening remarks, I, th I would love if we would delve a little bit into the super hyper-sensitive media's role in that exact you know, point. And with that, I think that's my cue to pass the mic. <laughs> no, I would just normally say pass the mic if you knew my husband. <laughs> So I'll just say a, a couple of things. One, uh, I think you know, Carl's data are, are very useful. Also, to put them in an international context, this is a global phenomenon. So we see this sort of populist anger around the globe that's occurring. It's resulting in a decline in trust in political institutions in all advanced industrial democracies. So uh, the, the populist anger targeted towards media, targeted towards government and public service, we see around the globe. For the first time in surveys nationally, we also see that targeting global NGOs and global businesses. So the decline in trust that's happening in the United States is, is not unique to the U.S. The re most recent Gallup survey on public trust shows that of the 14 institutions that they survey, 13 of those are, are, are down, only the military is up. On average, 32% of people express trust in our national institutions, those are faith organizations, NGOs, as well as Congress, the presidency, and the Supreme Court. So it's a broad global phenomenon. Part of it is certainly this heightened uh, polarized and deeply fragmented media environment in which voices that are uh, denigrating public service, that are uh, deeply cynical, uh, are elevated. Uh, but there's some other things going on too, and I'll mention two quick things. One uh, that concerns me is, is this is largely a story about millennials. So the 18 to 35 year olds are now our largest generation. They're the biggest segment of the workforce. They potentially could have been the largest voting bloc in the last electorate. They weren't because they don't vote which is part of the hint here, right? Um, but millennials have the lowest levels of public trust of any generation. And so as population replacement is happening, millennials like public service as volunteerism and nonprofits and social entrepreneurship, but they deeply dislike government and politics and public service. And that's, that's problematic and concerning. The second thing Jonathan Rausch writes about uh, what, what he calls chaos syndrome, which is within parties we're now seeing uh, rising in civility and, and, um, and, and, and polarization within parties. I've, I've been, I guess, fortunate to live in mostly one party states. Uh, the, the conflict that we are seeing in some of these states is intra-party conflict, uh, where political leadership doesn't have the ability to contain these intermediary institutions, political leaders, whether those are legislative leaders or political parties, that historically have been able to uh, sort of thin from the herd those who are demonstrating incivility or attacking the institution have lost their ability to do so. So what we're seeing in, in a, lot of, a lot of state capitals, I think, is uh, within even majority parties are these sort of once marginal voices are getting louder and more extreme, uh, they're certainly getting more attention from, from media, and they're being uh, able to be deeply disruptive in terms of build, building public cynicism and distrust of the institution. Just very briefly, I want to follow up on, on some of these comments, and, and particularly what Steve said about, uh, about John Kennedy. And I, I'm, I'm going to turn it around a little bit, and I hope I don't offend you, Steve, but, but he talked about transparency. I've worked with enough of you politicians and, and legislators to know that you cannot be transparent about everything. John F. Kennedy could not be transparent about everything, but he gave, he gave the appearance of transparency, right? So my message to you today, if you hear nothing else from me today, it's communicate, communicate, communicate. I've lived in four states, Michigan, Illinois, Missouri, and Colorado. And I've been a voter for more than 30 years. I can count on one hand how many times I've received a communication from my state legislator, either representative or senator. I don't hear from you enough. You need to send me a newsletter. Newsletter. You need to invite me to an event. You know, at least three times a year, reach out to me and let me know that you're thinking about me. Because I guarantee the next time I hear about you is when I get a mailer from your opponent telling me how nasty you are. So 
communicate, communicate, communicate. Thank you, Carl. You've kind of been called out there a little bit. Uh, <laughs> would you care to respond to that? Or, you know, a better question. If JFK was in today's political climate, would that have translated that same message with the media and the hypersensitivity towards, well, everything? I, 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 the specifics are different. I, I would never presume to say what John Kennedy would do in 2017, but the theory of communication, then he used this new medium called live televised press conferences. So it is likely to think about what are the new medium today and how to use it, but in a, in a two-way communication, not a one-way communication, because I think communication is critical, but he, literally having press being able to ask any questions and either be able to get the answers or things like that. So I think using the w wide range of ways to communicate and doing it in a way that is two-way to ensure that honest dialogue. Okay. Well, we're gonna go ahead and open it up if everybody feels that they've had their time. Uh, if you would just point out Questions, we'll go right here. Thank you, uh, Representative Dan Sadler from Alaska and a former reporter in FLAC for our state house. Um, understanding the problem, I think we all know what the problem is, there's cynicism and so forth. What can we actually do? Um, I, I don't know how much of the problem is based on reality and how much is based on the, uh, the cynicism that comes from easy access to uh, the, and the quick ability to get a laugh from making fun of politicians. What can we do to resolve this? You know, we all try to be ethical, we all try to be hardworking. Is there anything we can do to succeed in trying to actually polish the image of public service? Can, can I just, I'll just jump in and let you guys uh, follow up. Um, all, all these gentlemen here are on, are on the front lines of things. I've, I've spent my career kind of behind the scenes. I think the hardest thing for a legislator to do or a legislature is to, is to see the perception of them from outside themselves or the organization or the institution. So I say you have to depend on, on image consultants, and I'm not trying to sell my business because this is not what, what I do, but I've worked in this field long enough to know that, that you don't want just political consultants telling you what to do, you want image consultants telling you what to do. And if I could wave a magic wand and, and, and give a legislature advice, you're always gonna have infighting, you're not always gonna agree, the parties are always gonna differ on, on certain things, but do something two or three times a year to let the public know that your institution is valuable. There's nobody out there sending that message that the state legislature is a very important institution and, and why, why you need to pay attention to it. And I think that, that legislatures, Carl started the America's Legislators Back to School program, which I think was very successful, got, got legislators out, out in schools, and that was a very positive thing. But I think legislatures themselves really need to get together, get the two party leaders together and say, okay, let's do something two times a year to make sure people understand that the legislature is important, even though we agree. I agree with that. So as a, as a former journalist, you know, H.L. Mencken, the former journalist and writer, once said, for every complex problem, there's a simple answer that's always wrong. So there is no simple answer to it. But there are two things that many of you do now is highlight positive recognitions. Many of you as legislators get, re get recognized by various associations. Tell that story. Uh, we also have a program, as other presidential libraries do, where we recognize public service. Public service was something very important to John Kennedy. So, in fact, on the back table, there's information about the New Frontier Award. We also have the Profile and Courage Award. So find out what are ways to recognize that. The other thing is, by starting with the earlier comments about the lack of knowledge, you know, another statistic is only 26% of the people know that there's three branches of the government. And 10% think ju Judge Judy is on the Supreme Court. Uh, um, so increase civics education. I think the more kids know about government, that you go and speak to them, they come to the legislature, you material. Again, we have free nonpartisan stuff. It's all on the website, there's material back there. But the more kids know about government, that 26%, in, in 2011, it was 31%. So it's going in the wrong direction. So I think the more they know, that is one way to do it. But there's no one answer. Uh, as a member that was in the legislature, it was for a very long time, out for a while as a, as a private citizen and, and businessman, and now back in the legislature, I kind of have a unique dynamic of both sides of the coin. I think one of the most important things that I find effective is most people, don't really know what we do at our capitals. 
Most people don't really get the complexities of the budget or the complexities of how a bill becomes law or how much negotiating it takes to navigate a bill from a thought to the governor's desk. But where I think we can gain great value and great respect from our constituencies is if we have town hall meetings, if we utilize uh, social media by giving regular updates, even if it's not a formal newsletter, to give updates and show photographs of you um, at a back to school supply giveaway, or doing things in the community that's not necessarily tied directly to your legislative requirements, but showing that you care, showing that you're in the community. Um, Tip O'Neill once said, all politics is local. And although we're state legislators, uh, people back home want to see you in the community. They want to see you at uh, Neighborhood Night Out Against Crime. They want to see you doing things with the local schools and with local clubs and organizations. I think that goes a long way to showing that we're not just sitting in an ivory tower somewhere doing things that, that are above the people, but that we really are of and, of and with the people. So probably for most legislators in the room, you're already aware of this, but I think states are more important today than they probably were at any time in my lifetime. So with the deadlock at the national level, it creates a unique opportunity for states to solve public problems. Uh, the California legislature in the most recent PPIC survey is at 51% approval. Uh, there are a couple ways of looking at that. 51 isn't that high. That's probably 42% higher than it normally is. It's pretty remarkable, actually, for California to be at 51% approval for the state legislature. Partly that's because they're solving problems. Uh, there's unique opportunity for states to solve problems in this current environment. Uh, and, and so I'd, I'd, I'd say a couple things. One is uh, elections matter enormously. Uh, experimenting with electoral reform, and as California has done with the top two primary and with redistricting reform, has been largely successful in terms of public approval and trust of the process. Uh, the second thing I'd mention is you have to engage millennials. Uh, I, and, I, and I realize the political calculation of that, which is millennials don't vote, and so in a normal political context, engaging millennials is a losing proposition, because again, they're not aligned with either political party, and they're not particularly likely to turn out and vote. On the other hand, again, this is now the largest generation in the country, and their growing distrust of politics and the political system is not turning around. There is no sense that they're going to get older and suddenly change their political attitudes or behaviors. So how we engage millennials around, primarily their interests are around transparency and civility, which is why they're turned off towards politics. We've got to figure out how to engage the younger po portion of the electorate. Thank you. Next question. Thank you, and thank you for your comments. My name is Senator Joyce Waddell, and I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. I heard you talk a lot about town hall meetings and about communications. And my question is, how do you prevent, or how do you handle those town hall meetings, those public events, where you have people with negative comments, they look at the negative things in your voting record, even though you have so much good, and exploit upon those? That's, that's a great question, and I'll tell you, um, <clears throat> years ago when I was on the city council, I used to do town hall meetings and at the beginning of the town hall meetings, we would have wine and cheese. I quickly found out, not a good idea. The cheese was okay. The cheese was fine. I became the snack. Um, so, you know, these very kind people would come to the meetings and they'd have their glass of wine and then their inhibitions would go away and I became the sitting duck. Um, uh, I, I quickly realized that we should do wine after. Everybody wanted to get through the meeting real fast to get to the wine, so I survived. But I will tell you, one of the most important things, and you're right, you're gonna have people that come to town hall meetings and they'd rather gripe. To some extent, we have to own that. You know, that, that's a part of what comes with the territory. But I think you spin it by just listening, letting them their, air their, their uh, complaints, their concerns, own it, offer solutions, and then pivot to all of the things that you've done. Don't run from the things that we may not have done as well, because I think that just digs a deeper hole. Accept them and explain where we are. Most people, again, don't understand the complexities or the difficulties in getting things done, that we don't have a magic wand, and there's not just one button you can push to make things happen, that you require coordination with local, state, 
government and or the federal government or other members of the legislature and department heads to get things done. I find when, when you are open, honest, and accept shortcomings, that people are much more likely to accept that as opposed to the natural response, which is to be defensive and to say, oh, you only want to talk about what I didn't do. Look at all what I've done. I think you own it right up front, accept the fact that we're all human and that invite them to be a part of the solution. Listen, I'm one person, but I'd love to have you serve on a committee to help me address those things. Love to have you come and work with me, and you find those people turn around once all of a sudden they're part of the process and they see, hey, this guy or this lady is willing to work with me. They're listening. They're not perfect. They don't have all the answers, but it goes a long way. I hope that answered your question. And I, I'd like to offer just a couple of logistical type things. I got so, <laughs> I, I, I was, during, during the whole uh, health care debate, when the, con when the congressman would go home and all the constituents, you'd, all, you'd see the video of, of people yelling at them on the stage and right, there are different models to hold those type of meetings. So if you're worried about, you know, hecklers and, and people taking over the microphone, things like that, there are ways that you can set up like listening stations when people come in and they can go to different areas of their concern and voice their opinion. And then maybe you do a little talk and then go into breakout groups. So give, that, give those people an opportunity to voice their opinion and, and let them be heard. But you don't have to do it in such a public way where the television cameras are there rolling and, and it just makes the legislator or the congressman look, uh, look bad. Uh, there are just different models that, that you can use. And I've got my business cards and the handout back there. <laughs> I'd be glad to talk to you about it. Well, thank you. We'll move on to our next question. Please introduce yourself. My name is Marla Cook, and uh, I, too, am a public servant, but not in the state legislature. I'm a public school teacher from California. I was very struck by the comment about letting people in, and that relates to school teaching as well as uh, being in the public eye. And I don't think it's having uh, meetings. I don't think it's sending out newsletters. Uh, when we first came to California, to Sacramento, um, I had the occasion to meet uh, when a legislature, legislator who uh, was the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, very powerfully been in office for 20 years. We had a very meaningful conversation in a public setting. He invited me to shadow him. And I realized as I was listening that the shadowing is very much a, like inviting a parent in to observe my classroom. You only need one parent to come in and observe your classroom, to never come back, but to sing your praises, to become an advocate for you, because you have let them into, your, into what you do. Not to observe what you do, you've invited them into what you do. So I just wanted to suggest shadowing, inviting people from your districts to come and see what you do, to be part of what you do, to include them, as was just mentioned, into committees or things that you do. You don't need to have everybody come, but they will sing your praises, the ones who do. Thank you. Further questions? Representative Consett, if, if I may, you said you wanted us to get into the media. Yes. And let me just uh, kick it off here. Gene, Gene's the, uh, the expert on this, but NCSL has just uh, recently concluded a two-year study of political polarization in state legislatures and its impact on policymaking. And as part of that study, we went around to 10 state capitals and interviewed uh, more than 250 state legislators. And uh, the report on that, which is uh, available online now, uh, some of the most colorful quotes had to do with the media, and uh, particularly social media. Um, uh, one legislative leader from Virginia said to us, the media intrudes into every orifice of the public body. <laughs> and he was referring to the 24-hour news cycle that's fueled by uh, non-traditional bloggers and reporters and the social media and the tweeters and, and uh, talk radio. Another legislator from Tennessee told us that 
anything you say, whether it's in a committee, just a, an innocent question that you ask, or a, a, a conversation you have with a colleague in the hall that's overheard, that can be tweeted out immediately. And he said, the impact on us is that we're afraid to be candid any longer. We're afraid to throw out a new idea to ask uh, somebody who's testifying, well, what if we did this? All of a sudden, it becomes your proposal that, that you're going to do something uh, that the, the tweeter finds is horrible. Um, and then uh, uh, another legislator from Virginia said, the internet leads to the spread of all kinds of misinformation. Wackos are all the time contacting legislators with all kind of shit and making themselves <laughs> famous by complaining online when the legislature doesn't do what they want them to do. So, Gene, can I throw that to you? <laughs> Well, and, and my Alaska friend here, who's a former reporter, uh, may, may have some thoughts on, on this as well. But here, here is my take. The, the, the message is control the conversation as best you can. You're, you're not going to win everything. But if you're not a part of social media, then yes, social media is going to take over your opinion about you. In other words, the, the, you're letting other people control your image, right? Uh, I'm going to give Carl a little hard time, but when that picture came up of the uh, car salesman and the legislator with his uh, head on, on the thing, it got a lot of laughter in the room, right? And I'm not sure which picture you're laughing at, the salesman or the, the legislature, but, but that, that immediately, that was an image that you all could relate to, right? And it fit into a stereotype that, that you, you know, that is in, in your mind, right? So you've got this stereotype about you, and if you're not out there controlling the conversation, you've got to do it. So you've got to get on social media. Or get, I guarantee you there are people in the district that would love to help you get on social media if you're not, if you're not you know, comfortable with that. But again, if you're not there, the total conversation is not going to be about, it's going to be about you, but not in the way that you want it. Here's another example about trying to influence media. You know, one of the biggest things that John Kennedy spent time thinking about is the space race. And if you think back to what we knew then, it didn't make any sense. We had, knew very little about the moon, very little about technology. In fact, the first uh, capsule that went up had half the computing power that your smartphone has in your pocket today. So one of the things, while he was trying to work on the technology and motivating NASA, he was thinking about public opinion. So he, and these are all public now, they're all uh, on the website, he organized some of the ticker tape parades when John Glenn came back, try to help shape public media. Because he understood it wasn't just to say, let's do the right thing, but let's encourage people to get involved. So encouraging that public dialogue in different ways, again, the, the, the format may be different, but thinking about kind of the end result, but then how to communicate in different ways with people is also something that uh, I think would reinforce what's been said. Wonderful. We're going to move on to another question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I actually grew up with Tip O'Neill and the Kennedys. Uh, my grandfather was Mayor Al Volucci of Cambridge, so a well-known mayor. But anyways, my question is here on the media, on how they turn things around, and how when you communicate, you've got to be very careful. And I'll give you an example. My name is Representative Al Baldessaro. Many of you have probably heard of me. Um, I'm a six-term state representative from New Hampshire. I was on the radio and made a comment. Now, we're a nation of laws. I'm the vice chair of veterans of state and federal veterans affairs. Uh, we were talking, I said, I'm speaking as a military man. I'm a 22-year retired Marine. We were talking about Hillary Clinton, Benghazi, the emails. And I said, Hillary Clinton should go in front of the firing squad and shot for treason. Now, I used in accordance with the US Code 18 in the Constitution. Everyone said I wanted her assassinated. Everyone said, we're a nation of laws now. You've got to be found guilty. But what I'm saying is, how do you handle that with the media on how they take your words out of context as a legislator when you speak? Because I heard some ahs in here. But as Americans and legislators, we have opinions in accordance with the law. How do we handle that? I know Tip O'Neill was great at it, and I, I was brought up and raised with the best of them. Thank you. Well, that's a great question. I, I am familiar with your story. I, I do remember reading about that. Um, 
the the hardest to me, I have uh, I have such great respect for all of you because I mean every like like Carl said on on you know no matter where you're at, what you say it's going to be reported, and whether you're on a radio program or talking to a reporter or in the elevator with someone that that has a blog uh, that you don't know about. You have to choose your words carefully all the time, anytime people are around, because they will be taken out of context. Now, so in your particular situation, when that happened, there's a choice that you have to make personally. Okay, do, do, I, do I apologize? Do I take control and, and, and get a message out there so that the story goes away? Or do I just kind of sit back and, and try to let it die out? It's a, it's a very tough call to make. I would say most of the time that you, you need to, to make some sort of statement that, that you're either sorry or that I misspoke or something, because that will, people, people will forgive you if you admit to making a mistake. Generally, I think this country is, is pretty good at that. So uh, that would be my, my advice, and I don't know if that's helpful to you, Representative, but uh, that, that's my take on it. In, in 2017, thank God we don't shoot people for treason anymore. So, uh, <laughs> I, I think the first thing would, I think, perhaps, I, I think the first thing would be to, you know, as you mentioned, own and be careful what you say. With with the advent of 24-hour news, social media, Twitter, Snapchat, Facebook, uh, anything you say can not only be taken out of context, but be, but also can be quickly broadcast and go viral across the country. So I think we have a responsibility, those of us who sit on a perch where people and our comments mean something, we have a responsibility to kind of be careful in what we say, and we balance it um, so it's not misconstrued or used in the wrong way. So rather it's uh, a, an off-color remark, a sexist remark, a, a partisan remark. Uh, some things are better left unsaid. Maybe the, the one thing I would maybe add um, is, is just to go back to what Carl pointed out at the beginning, which is the paradox here, which is most of you are not unpopular. Most of you are quite popular in your districts. Most of you are reelected overwhelmingly, right? So, I mean, the research shows that the, the number of, of marginal seats has declined dramatically over the last 30 years. So most legislators are reelected and reelected overwhelmingly. The problem is the institutions are not respected. And so while you actually can gain popularity, you can say something controversial that actually gain popularity among your constituents that undermines public trust in the institution, ultimately makes it more difficult for you to get your job done. Uh, but your popularity among your constituents may actually increase, right? So the challenge here for legislators is how do you actually protect the institution at the same time serving the interests of your, represent your, your, your constituencies, right? It's relatively, doing one or the other is a relatively straightforward task. Balancing the paradox of both appealing to your constituency and maintaining public trust of the institution so that you can get your work done, that's, that's a much more difficult proposition. Thank you. If I could follow up on Corey on your last uh, comment, because it's, uh, I think it's critically important. I think for all, uh, Steve McCarter, state, uh, state rep, Pennsylvania, um, we're elected by two groups of people in Real. We're elected by one group of people, but we represent two groups of people. We represent the people within our districts, but we also represent our entire state. And I think as legislators, you know, sometimes we put our own existence at the top of that list far more than we do the existence of the state. And that cynicism that comes as a result of that, I think is in some of the statistics we've seen today. And I wanna go back to the millennial comment that you made also that is critically important because I think of another generation, going back to the Kennedy generation. Those of us that became millennials at that time and so forth, we had a little thing called the Vietnam War that made us very cynical in many ways. And out of that, many of us, began our look at public service from the idea of whether we went into teaching, as somebody suggested back here, or we went into public service in government. And we wanted to make it better. Today, we have to deal with a millennial problem where they're coming out of college with a debt that exceeds what their parents ever had as a debt. And they don't see us as doing anything about that particular issue. When I talk about talk to millennials in my district, that's what I find as an overriding issue. They need economic help 
And the question that comes out of that, <laughs> thank you, the question that comes out of that is how do we deal with that to get the millennials back on track to wanting to get into the service to be able to help, whether it's in teaching, which is in trouble, or in government service where we have great people who are leaving now? Real quickly, better pay for both. <laughs> And very seriously, we have school teachers who are in charge of one of the most significant tasks, and that is molding and teaching our young, our young students, but they're grossly, across the country, grossly underpaid. Members of the legislature who, if we aren't careful, will end up only having the elite, the wealthy, or retired to serve because the young person coming out of college with mounting debt <clears throat> can't afford to serve in the legislature. And they're some of the best and brightest that we have. So we've got to find a way, and I'm not speaking self from a, from a self-preservation standpoint, but for bringing new people in, in order to, to make, the, make it more attractive and more competitive, school teachers who are among the best people in the world are grossly underpaid. Public servants who give time and time again are underpaid and punished because of the past sins of others. We've got to turn that around. We've got to change the image, and that's why I love this, this, this segment of reclaiming the image of, of state legislators is so significant. And you have to make it attractive so we don't get the people that enter public life because they have larceny in their hearts or because they have ego issues. We have to make it attractive so we can get the best and the brightest that our communities have to offer. The, uh, oh, no, go ahead. Um, the, uh, your, your question also referred to the impact on the institution. So I, you know, I'd like to turn the discussion just slightly toward not just reclaiming the image of public servants and, and elected officials, but of the institution of the legislature. Because all this cynicism and, and distrust of uh, politicians has an impact on the, on the uh, institution. Uh, first of all, it's, it's pretty demoralizing to those of you who serve in elected office. Uh, uh, about 15 years or so ago, Frank Luntz, who's speaking here uh, tomorrow, the pollster, did an NCSL session where he, the audience had clickers that could respond to, a que to questions that were asked. And uh, he, he asked a question, what do you like least about serving in the legislature? And he gave him five or six choices, things like uh, the, the conflicts uh, with my family life, the, the nastiness of campaigns and uh, things like that. But one of them was public cynicism. Guess what came out number one in the responses, the clicks on, the, on that question? It was public cynicism. And I think that that kind of atmosphere is, is hinders the recruitment of candidates. There are people who look at it and say, I don't want any part uh, of that system. I think the uh, 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 context of cynicism also has an impact on uh, the ability to reach consensus. Uh, to, in a, in a, especially in a polarized political world, the ability to negotiate differences. And I think it weakens representative democracy uh, so that uh, we get things like term limits and tax and expenditure limits that come out of this, that come through the initiative process that, that distrusts the legislature. And I think that, that in a lot of ways, the cynicism promotes the, the alternatives to representative democracy. What are those alternatives? Well, one is a direct democracy, initiatives, electronic democracy that a lot of people want to talk about. Or the other alternative is just turning it over to strong executives, the man or the woman on the white horse. Um, and we don't want to see that. So I think that that it's not just important to combat this from the standpoint of the individual, uh, but also from the standpoint of the institution. Um, I agree with the points that were just said. Another way to think about this, another element, is promoting service, promoting engagement. Um, John Kennedy obviously did the Peace Corps. Today, AmeriCorps um, 
you know, it's, it's, it's survived, hopefully it will continue to survive, but for every seat that is in AmeriCorps, I think there's either 10 or 12 applicants. There are a few states that have a state version of a state core. So promoting service, it's like letting folks come in to be a, 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 in your classroom. The more they know about how it works and they participate, then it's going to affect their lives. Out of the 225,000 people in Peace Corps, there's a disproportionate number of them that are in public service, whether it be in teaching or elected office or nonprofit, because they've seen the impact. So promoting service at the state level and local level is one of the other tools. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Those are all um, very thought-provoking answers. It's really helpful because this is a big problem, and I'm glad that we're having this session. Um, my, qu I want to circle back to the media issue because um, I had two conversations recently about my state, which is West Virginia. My name is Barbara Evans Fleischauer. I'm a delegate from West Virginia. I've been in the legislature 21 years, and. Um, and they were both upsetting. One was uh, with a young person who had come in and was trying to promote our state. We have a very terrible image, just like legislators. This is a kind of a big analogy. And he worked on it for two years with national media, and he could not get anyone interested, any national media interested in some of the creative, exciting things that are going on at the local level. So he left. The second part of that is there was a, a national media that was interviewing me about the opioid crisis. And we do have the highest death rate per capita in the country, but lots of other states. Um, and I, and I, I was sort of upset about this other issue, and I'm like, well, is there um, anything positive you can say in the media? And she's like, well, no. What we do is conflict. And I guess I'd like to hear a little bit more about that problem with the media wanting to have a controversy, because I feel like we are the brunt of that, that they want to make a controversy that ends up making us look bad. Thank you. Uh, you, you raise a, an excellent point. And uh, I will say that of all the presentations I've done before legislators in, in my career, the thing I always focus on is understanding the media. Again, it's that perception. I mean, you're, you're inside the box and trying to look, look from outside the box in is, is a difficult thing to do. But the one thing you, you, to get better at this is to understand what, what makes news. What is it that, that really triggers interest? So I, I can appreciate your, uh, the, the person that you mentioned that tried to get national media attention on, uh, on something. Again, it, it's, it's helpful to, to work with someone that understands the media, so say, okay, how can I pitch this story? What kind of angle can I give them that they will bite? If you want national attention, the best thing to do is try to get a story in the New York Times. Every other media in the country follows the New York Times, so if you're looking for national attention, try to figure out how to get in there and get that, and get that story. On the local level, at state legislatures, you all know that, that there are less and less media there covering what you're doing anymore. Uh, newspapers are not controlled by local people hardly anymore. Uh, there are rare exceptions, but for the most part, they're you know, all Gannett or uh, some other organization has, has bought them out. So that local control is kind of lost and, and they're really more interested in profits than they are reporting news. So it kind of gets back to my, my other point is that you've got to create your own news channel. You can't depend on the media to tell your story. You've got to figure a way to tell your story either through social media or holding events or doing some sort of PR thing to attract their attention so they go home. Oh, well, maybe that's something that we should look at. So I, it's, it's not an easy answer. Uh, I, I know it's not connecting probably with a lot of you, but that's, that's really the approach that you have to take. All right, we have another question. Good morning, and thank you so much for coming and offering us your um, knowledge and wisdom. I'm Kathy Breen. I serve in the Maine State Senate. And I want to get back to the question that Kurt started with about, sorry, Carl Kurt started about <laughs> how few folks know what the legislature does and how it works. Um, I want to echo what the public school teacher said earlier, and I've found it very effective to invite constituents uh, 
up to Augusta to shadow me, and, and that's always very fruitful. But of course, that's a small minority of people who can spend that kind of time and have that kind of inclination. But I'm always amazed when I'm knocking on doors and taking phone calls or what have you about how few people really understand how the process works. And it's not rocket science. So my question to you is, do you have suggestions about how we can work with our communities to inform them about the process? Because when I try, people tend to glaze over. Thank you. So um, I want to say, by the way, that the school teacher was the mother of Corey Cook. So uh, <laughs> he, he, he has good genes. Uh, but uh, uh, Gene mentioned earlier NCSL's America's Legislators Back to School program. And uh, I would urge you to, if, if you don't know about it, to get involved with that. Uh, the, NCSL produced a whole wide range of materials that tell the positive story about representative democracy and how it works. It's not perfect, but it works better than any conceivable alternative. And uh, so uh, th there are materials there from uh, uh, first and second grade to adult materials. Uh, there are exercises you can use in a class classroom, like the, uh, in an elementary school, the, the perfect chocolate chip cookie exercise, where uh, the, the, the legislator comes into the classroom and asks, uh, the students, what makes a perfectly good chocolate chip cookie? And uh, they say, oh, that's easy. And I, one says, I love nuts. And then all of a sudden, another says, I hate nuts. And still a third says, I like it soft. And another says, I like it chewy. And it immediately becomes clear to them something as simple as a chocolate chip cookie is something that people disagree about. And just like public policy issues that seem simple on their surface, uh, but when you get into the details, uh, they're very, very difficult. So th th that's a resource that is available to you uh, that, that is designed uh, for legislators to share in the classroom. And I think that, that that was the conclusion of NCSL. The only way we could address that cynicism was to try to get at it in the early years uh, when kids are in school and to try to try to uh, turn that around. I, I want to reinforce that message. As I say, there's no one answer, Senator, but clearly working with students. And there's a lot of great information was just referred to. We and most presidential libraries have on their website materials. I have some material back there. Again, it's all, all free that's available for a classroom. The other thing is uh, you speaking in middle schools or high schools, if you can figure out a way to do it on a regular basis so that it, you're, you're reaching lots of people. Um, in the last panel, we just had the uh, uh, f uh, current main treasurer, used to be a legislator, she would every Thursday bring three eighth graders to the Capitol with her and they would shadow her. And over the course of a year, there would be a large number of eighth graders and over time, um, so she built connections, but also they understood more about government. So it's both bringing them to see, having you go to see them, sharing this information. I think the kids, um, are, it's, it, it, there's so much opportunity there. So I would just add, there's a, there's a real crisis in, in civic education and civic literacy. Uh, I think, it, you know, Stanford just came out with a, a study that showed that, that students can't discern the difference between paid advertisements and, and factual news content on the web. Uh, so th this is a real problem. Uh, I would say we need to create more space for real civic education from K through college. Uh, but also in response to the question earlier about uh, about debt and, and, and higher education. I'm a, I'm a dean in a public institution. We need to do a better job in our public institutions. Uh, certainly we need to work with you, legislators in the room, more closely. But we, we need to ensure that our students are actually graduating with skills to be effective in public service. Part of the reason that we've moved away from liberal arts and from public service oriented education is because the perception that our students don't get good jobs when they graduate. Partly that's a national sort of 
myth, and partly that's true, because we're not as effective as we need to be in preparing our students effectively for jobs. So our students are graduating, in many cases, without the skills that employers need. So they say, I can't hire millennials because they don't have communication skills, data skills, analytic skills, quantitative reasoning skills, ability to visualize data. We actually can't hire your students to do what we need them to do. That's largely on us, as well as it is on the sort of national uh, trend from the K through 12. And I'll just add one more logistical type thing. I would encourage all of you to look at your colleagues in the legislature and find those that get 60, 70 percent voter approval and find out what they do. I mean, you're gonna, they're going to say, well, Pat doesn't do social media or Nancy doesn't do, uh, you know, communicate with the media or, or whatever. But I think you'll find some common themes about how they do connect with the public. They're, they're doing something to, to, that that the public loves them. So I would talk to those colleagues and, and just find out what they're doing, and I think you'd learn a lot. Uh, Solomon Goldstein, real estate rep from Massachusetts. Um, a couple of you have touched on this a, a little bit, but uh, getting at the increased uh, fractured nature of media in the US and you know, in, in JFK's time, he can do these ticker tape parades and there are a small number of TV stations and few other media sources. And so everyone in the country watched the same thing and we were all a community together. And that is the opposite now. Do you have suggestions on how, you know, we've got a, a lot of great ideas on getting info to our own constituents to help with our own image and maybe the image of the body that we serve in, but in terms of, unifying the country the way that you could when everyone watched one or more of three TV stations um, and, and getting a message like that out and getting people, yeah, suggestions? Well, I, <laughs> sorry, I feel like I'm hogging the microphone a little bit here, but um, I, I do. I, I think what, it goes back to the, this this whole image thing, and, and again, you're never you you know in in theory that you're going to 30 percent of the people are going to are going to disagree with what you do or what you say, right? So you, you have to kind of ignore those, but try to make the the other 70 percent kind of agree with with you. So it's all about image and what you're putting out there and what you're trying to create for yourself that people know about you. Uh, it, it's telling your own personal story, I think, is really when you get into it. I mean, it's, it's, it's so opposite of, of ticker tape uh, parade advice, but it really starts from within, and what's the story that, that you're wanting to tell? Uh, I know with all the legislators I've worked over the years, they're so concerned about policy, and I've given this communication advice, and a lot of people have said, you know, I just don't, I don't have time for it, I don't have the resources for it, or whatever. I really got to focus on, on the policy. Well, you're not going to be able to focus on the policy if you don't sell your story to your constituents. Sir, that's sort of, my question is a little bit opposite. Not okay. how So oh. can you know, any, any institutions shift this fracturization of media? Uh, yeah, I, I don't, I, I, I think it's a great question, Representative, and it's clearly above my pay grade. Um, <laughs> it is getting the folks that own big media to understand this and for them to take responsibility and to think about, but it's very hard because of the ratings. In terms of your piece of it, it is communicating where the people are. You know, you know, uh, Willie Sutton, the bank robber, said, what, when asked, why does he rob banks? It's where the money is. You know, in terms of communicating, it's communicate where the people are and finding ways so that that, you know, if you're not on social media, you're you're letting that void happen. But you're, the fundamental question is a big one. I don't know the answer to that. So at the risk of being controversial, the problem isn't the media, the problem is us and the, what we want to consume, right? So we are, we are seeking out media that confirm our existing biases rather than wanting to read alternative media. There's a great uh, study that came out in the 2012 election that showed um, People who viewed sort of partisan media, so liberals who watched MSNBC got less factual questions correct, and conservatives who watched Fox News got less factual questions correct than those who had no access to media at all. In other words, the, the stuff we take in is, like, is, is actually disinformation in terms of reinforcing our partisan biases so we can't then answer factual questions correct. But the, the usual solution then is we say, well, then what you ought to do is have a balanced media diet and read or listen to or watch the other side. It turns out that study, I think it was out of uh, Wellesley. I'm going to get that wrong. But in any case, uh, it showed that actually that had 
an even worse effect. So liberals who watch Fox News got even more wrong, and conservatives who watch MSNBC got even more wrong, because then you just say, well, I know everything I'm about to watch is not true, and therefore you just, because again, you're looking to confirm your own biases, you actually even get more wrong. So the, the challenge is, I don't think the political, the, I'm sorry, the fragmentation of the media is not gonna change, because our consumption habits are not gonna change. The question is, is how do we begin to speak truth to our own communities when we're wrong, right? And again, the research shows the only way you're gonna end up changing this confirmation bias is if liberals speaking to liberals say, actually, turns out we got this one wrong. And conservatives speaking to conservatives, actually, again, the, back to the, so the profiles in courage, right? Have, be able to say, you know, our, our guy screwed up, right? Um, so the challenge is, is that the public is certainly, and this is not new, uh, I mean, political psychology shows this, you're looking to confirm what you already believe to be true through your media habits. The challenge is, is how do you then speak in a way that challenges those assumptions among your own constituents? Um, so again, I think the problem is, is, is us, not necessarily the, the, the media or the structure of the media. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ellen Spiegel, Assemblywoman from Henderson, Nevada. And my question is related to constituent apathy. I'm finding that the people who are most engaged are the extremists on both sides, and the people in the middle are tuning out completely. And I'm wondering if you have any tips for us on reaching out and breaking through to the people who are just putting their hands over their ears and saying, I just can't take this anymore. I don't want to hear any of it. I don't want to hear the good you've done. I don't want to hear the bad you've done. I just want to tune out. Go back to basics. I think for the people who are either below or above the learning curve, I think going back to basic and connecting with the people I find to be successful. Going back, because there is such apathy, because people think that we're all crooks and people think that we don't care and that we make you know tons of money and we live in an ivory tower and we don't drive on the same potholes that they drive over and we don't see the same mosquito infestation in the summertime that they do, just remind them that you know I live in your neighborhood. I've never met a pothole that I want to keep. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't like the mosquitoes any more than you do, and we have only so many tools in our toolbox to address them. And when all things are equal, what makes the difference between you and the person they don't like is when you get out and make it personal. When they feel your pain and you feel their pain and you connect on a communication level with them by going to areas that are non-traditional for the, the elected official to be, uh, to show up at, at graduations when you aren't invited, to show up in your lo local churches or synagogues, to, 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 to be there and show people that you're real. I think people follow people that they like and that they respect. And when you gain their respect and you're transparent and honest with them, tell them the good, the bad, and the ugly, some of that apathy chips away. Go ahead. You know, um, I'm from Indiana, Jim Merritt. Um, when I get a bad email, an evil email as we call it, how many legislators do we have in the room? Okay, how many of you get evil email? Okay. What I do is I print the email off and I go see them. And you could disagree but not be disagreeable. And. Uh, so I, 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 I'm on my way home from work, and, and I uh, maybe have four people to stop and see. And I see Mrs. Stuff and Stuff, and, and I said, uh, I knock on the door, and I go, well, um, my name's Jim Merritt. And they go, who? <laughs> and I said, well, I got, an, I got an email from you either today or two weeks ago, and you called me a coward because of this issue. And I said, I'd like to talk to you about it. Well, first of all, they'll either go back, 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 and, and just say, I, I, you know, I, I'm sorry and all that, or, or we'll disagree. It's not a bad idea to disagree. And they'll get to know you, and I think they'll respect you more, and, and you'll walk away. Maybe, they, maybe you won't agree, but uh, you've established a working relationship with one of your constituents, and uh, maybe chipped away at what we're talking about here because uh, you know social media and videos are great and everything but when somebody and you knock on somebody's door and they don't like alcohol policy because 
they're 67 years old and in your state you have to show ID if you're um, under 40 and they card you and the little girl down the street is the, is the cash register and she knows you're 67 years old and, and, and state law is strange that way. But I think the more they get to know you, the more the ripples effect you make. And we can, we can play a large role in tearing down um, uh, that bad image that others make of us. Well, I think with that, I want to say thank you for everybody that's stuck around, and I hope you've gotten something from it. I'm going to give each one of our panelists a couple minutes to wrap this up, and when they are done, you are also invited. The uh, Legislative Effectiveness Committee is having a luncheon, and we are at 253B, and you are all welcome to come. And I also want to thank the Women's Legislative Network for co-sponsoring this uh, group. I think it's been a good discussion. So, gentlemen? Well, we haven't talked about one aspect of uh, a, a, a contributor to this public cynicism, and I hate to say it, but it's what some of you do and have done. Do any of you know of a candidate, maybe someone who ran against you, who said, elect me and I'll clean up that mess at the Capitol? <laughs> or um, the legislator who says to a constituent who's complaining, well, I'm not the problem, it's all those other guys, it's the urban legislators or the rural legislator or the D's or the R's, they're the ones who are messing it up. By doing that, you're campaigning against the institution, you are tearing it down. Please don't do it. Um, first, I just want to congratulate the legislator who just spoke about the idea and reaching out, and that, that's an, a great example of both communication and civility. And I think those are great watchwords for you know everyone in their respective roles of communicating in lots of different ways, one-on-one, -on -one, social media, in different ways, and communicating in a, in a civil way. So thank you for being here. I, I want to also thank you for the opportunity to be here and. Uh, I kind of was a, a fill-in today, so I'm real happy to have had the opportunity to join the panel. Um, but equally as important is I'd like to offer <clears throat> a round of applause for all of our elected officials and public servants because you take on a tough task. You're kicked way more than you're kissed. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. God knows we appreciate it and we need good people like you. I think maybe the, the one thing I would add, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about red states and blue states, and as most of you know, the polarization is, is really much more granular than that. It's really a urban rural. Uh, if you look at the maps nationally of, the, of county results, uh, you, you can really see that it's not so much the states that are divided, but within states even. And so again, the challenge that we have, you know, a state like Idaho, is that the uh, going to Boise is not only going to work in the state house; it's also sort of the one blue spot in a, an otherwise, I think, red state in America, right? Um, and so the challenge of how we address this is largely about how do we, you know, solve challenges that divide our states, right? Divide our communities. And so this, this, you know, I, we did a lot of work in Idaho around civility, <clears throat> and the work has been largely around how do we bridge this urban rural divide within our state uh, because ultimately that's a lot of the the red blue partisan stuff actually boils down into real urban rural issues more than it is about party or ideology uh, and so I think the civility piece is really critically important it's, it's, it's really important that we work across the state and across these other uh, important boundaries in geographic boundaries well, then I will just close that uh, I feel very fortunate to be on this distinguished panel. Uh, I do have uh, some handouts back there, six things that I hope you take away from what I've said today. Uh, I know my, the message of communicating is, is hard to accept, but I, I just I can't express it enough. The other thing I want to talk just to end on is bipartisanship and working together. And I think two of the best speeches I've heard in my entire life were given over the last 10 days or so. And the first one was when John McCain went to the Senate floor and talked about bipartisanship and did, did a good job of blaming both parties uh, on, on the state that we're in right now. But I just really think it was one of the, the best 
One of the best speeches I've heard on this subject. The other one was last night, LaDainian Tomlinson, who is a running back for the San Diego Chargers, uh, was inducted to the NFL Hall of Fame last night, and just a powerful, powerful speech about uh, urging everyone to work together and, 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 and help one another, and I'd encourage you to watch those. Well, thank you. If we can give a round of applause for our panel. <laughs>